you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we've been in the middle of a series going through the Sermon on the Mount, which is these first, uh, not these first, uh, these three chapters in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. We're still in Matthew 5, and so probably about year 2025 will be finished, so we'll see if we can pick up the pace uh, here a little bit. Um, but uh, we know that you guys, uh, what I'm hearing is that you're appreciating um, these topics. Um, honestly, um, I've been very encouraged the past several weeks hearing some feedback that some of you have been giving me via email or text messages or, or calling me or just having conversations in the hallway. Uh, honestly, I've been very encouraged by how um, our church family as a whole ha- has been growing through these very difficult topics. Um, I'll be honest with you, um, I, I have not really been looking forward to this particular section. There are some, by the way, next week is one that I'm really, I can't wait to teach on. It's just one that I've really loved, um, and so that'll be next week. Um, but um, I, I, I've been hesitant in many ways to deal with some of these things. As a pastor who has the, the gift of mercy, um, that's kind of why I, I've been a little bit, um, uh, I guess, hesitant to deal with some of these uh, heavy topics. Um, not because I've questioned whether or not I should share these truths, but because I've questioned at how well that, you've been, uh, that you'll be receptive of these truths. So that's really what it all comes down to. Here at Golf U, we always like to just, um, we, we want to um, use God's Word as we're anchored to God's Word, and so that's a part of our values, and so we just share exactly what God's Word said. And so this is the truth, as sometimes as difficult as the truth can be, right? Um, but again, thank you so much for some of the feedback that, we've been, uh, that you've been giving me and that I've been hearing has been very encouraging, and uh, thank you. So here Jesus in this section has been dealing with what is morally right and wrong, and so we've been talking about a lot of those things, or specifically how a righteous person is to live their life in a world as salt and light. Remember, he kind of shared that with us just a couple of weeks ago. Jesus was kind of helping ramp up this particular section, and so he's saying, as a, as a follower of mine, this is how I want you as a righteous person to live your life. And so he's been talking about a lot of these um, cultural, pop, pop cultural topics in his day, which just so happened to be very culturally relevant in our day as well. And so when Jesus begins, we've kind of been saying this little catchphrase, he does not begin by theorizing or, or speculating. Instead, Jesus dives right into the guts of our human existence because this is the stuff of real life. Um, this, is, this is where you and I live This is why um, some of these topics have been hard, but yet they've been so encouraging because this is where we live, and so we need to hear these types of of topics. Today's passage gives us the fourth illustration. Remember that there are six illustrations that Jesus is going to give us in this particular section of his Sermon on the Mount, and today we come to the fourth illustration as Jesus is using these illustrations to again predict a Uh, to depict a person who is living a righteous life. This is how they are to live their life. Um, You've heard that it's been said these things, and those are good, but I want to emphasize that, and I want to um, uh, bring some, um, uh, some strength to that. And so this is also what I'm adding and what I'm saying that you need to, ways that you need to live your life. Specifically, one that surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, which we studied that way back in verse 20. If you remember, he kind of uh, said that you need to live your life in a way that's righteous that surpasses the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And again, we come to number four of the six. And so today, the topic that Jesus chooses to share with us is lies and truth. So happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Um, Lies and truth is going to be the Mother's Day sermon that we are going to address. Because if anyone should be telling you the truth, it should be your mother, right? Would you agree? Unless your mom's a liar, then of course um, we're in a different story there. But um, Jesus thought, for some reason, Jesus thought that this particular topic was important for him to address in his grand Sermon on the Mount. And so this is the topic that he now takes us to, lies and truth. And if it's important to Jesus and he's sharing this in his sermon, then I believe it should be important to us, right? So we should have all ears here this morning. So I want to start with a question. Um, we, we throw around this word authenticity. It's a part of one of our value statements that we are to be authentic. We feel like that's really where real life happens when we can be authentic with each other. And so I'm just going to ask a question. Just going to ask that you just raise your hand to answer that question if this is you. Um, how many of you have ever told a lie before in your life? Just told a lie before in your life. Okay. <clears throat> there are some of you that we need to talk afterwards uh, because <clears throat> you just lied. Um, okay. <laughs> So now let's ask the question again, and we can all raise our hand again. So how many of you have ever told a lie? That, that's all of us. 
Now, now, I don't know if you looked around, but I looked around. I saw a lot of lying moms, and so um, this is just a messed up church with some lying mothers in the room, but, um, but I'm glad that we were able to be authentic and say, this is where we're all at. So we know that we're at the, uh, at the foot of the cross is all level, right? We're all on the same turf here. Um, this is where we are. And so maybe you haven't lied recently, or maybe you have. Or maybe this was a lifestyle for you when you were in the business world years ago. Or maybe this is a lifestyle for you and you're still struggling with this wherever you are. We all, at some point or another, have struggled or still are struggling with lies. And I hope that by the end of this that you're going to understand, you're going to come to this realization that you probably are a little more deceptive than you really think you are. As I worked through this, I really battled, and I'm just being real with you, I really battled with, with this, and I thought to myself, wow, you know what, maybe there are times that I'm just not as truthful as I really feel like I am, the way that we sometimes embellish things. And so I'm not saying that I'm a lying person, uh, but yet at the same time, what I am saying is that I struggle with this too. And hopefully as we work through this, you'll understand kind of what I mean by that as we hit this. Um, and so um, last week, it was interesting, we, we talked about divorce. Um, this week, uh, we talk about lies. The week before divorce was adultery. I find it very fascinating that Jesus kind of sandwiches divorce in between these very, very heavy topics of adultery and lies. Because what is one of the most, uh, the most uh, marriages probably fail most with one of those two things, adultery or lies. You know, it's when, it's when you can't be honest with your spouse. It's when, there's, um, when your marriage is on the rocks because nobody's being truthful and that typically it can cause quite a bit of marital strife. And so I just kind of find that interesting the way kind of Jesus kind of sandwiches divorce in between those two particular topics. Now, speaking of lies, last week I lied to you. Um, I told you that this week that we were going to talk about marriage and that this week we were going to, um, I I felt like last week we talked about the ugliness of divorce and I felt like we left, you know, left on kind of a bit of a sour note where it was just still ugly. And I don't like leaving on ugly notes. I like leaving on beautiful notes. And so I said, this week we're going to talk about the beauty of marriage. Well, we're not. Um, so, so I lied. So, but here's, here's why. I want to explain why. See, I'm already trying to explain and justify my lie. Um, uh, it's because it didn't work out this week. But what I'm going to do is when life groups are over, which is in a few weeks, I'm going to bring back this topic of marriage. But I felt like it'd be best that we bring that back um, when this particular section of the Sermon on the Mount is over. So trust me, it's very important to my heart that we do that. So if you could just hang on to the edge of your seats, we will bring marriage back in just a few weeks. And so just so you know that. And so sorry for some of you who are looking forward to that. Um, I just come back in a few weeks and we will definitely hit that topic. So let's hop right in and let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. We're going to start with the first verse here out of these five verses that we'll be looking at today. Again, you have heard that it was said. So Jesus, right out of the gate, just kind of goes with this same rhythm that he's been telling us each week, right? Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Now, today we live in what we would call a written culture. <clears throat> Compared to the time of Jesus, he um, was, was an oral culture. So written culture today, oral culture more in Jesus' day. And so as a result of our written culture today, one way that we make oaths, which oath is really another way that we could say a promise. So whenever I say oath, just think of promise, okay? Um, and so another um, a way that we make oaths today is normally by our signature, right? It's, so it's, it's a written culture. And so you go to your bank, whoever your bank is, and you say, I need X amount of money so I can buy a house. And then on that day when you buy a house, it's crazy. There's about 500 pieces of paper and there's about 15 signatures and you're signing your life away, right? And you're signing that in the presence of other witnesses. And you're saying in this written culture that I'm signing my, my name on the dotted line because if I default on this mortgage, I'm giving you permission to come after me. Right? And I'm giving you permission to take the house back. That's kind of what you're saying in our written culture today. In Jesus' culture, again, a more oral culture, it was my word is my bond. And so um, I would say years and years ago, maybe when some of you grew up, we were kind of, even though it still was a written culture, our, your word was your bond. And so you made a deal back a couple hundred years ago. You'd shake on it, right? And you could trust that person's handshake, right? And so that was an an oral culture that maybe we had a part of. But 
I would, it's my opinion that the oral culture today is gone, right? Because nobody believes anybody else. And so nowadays you got to give blood, you got to give your firstborn, you got to do all these things in order to back up your words because your word is no longer your bond because nobody can trust anybody anymore. And obviously in this room, everybody's hand went up. So you're all liars, right? So I don't believe you anyways. And so um, this is the, the, the world that Jesus lived in, in this oral um, <clears throat> world, this, uh, as, as far as oral culture, um, written uh, your oral word, <clears throat> excuse me. But we're going to see that the principle is the same. An oath is, is an observed word. That's what, the, what an oath means. It's an observed word. So when you sign, there are witnesses. Um, there's a notary, right? You need people to back up that signature. And so that's what the, the, the word oath is, just simply an observed word. Um, and so others are observing, and as a result, you are held accountable and you must be true to your word. We go back to the topic of marriage. Marriage is all about a covenant. It's about being true to your word. Again, Jesus sandwiches those two, you know, um, sandwiches that in between those other two things. Again, I find that fascinating. So the battle for truthfulness, we will learn from Jesus, is fought in every little yes and every little no of your lives. It's not like the past difficult topics that we've addressed. It's not like adultery. It's not like anger or violence that that often will lead to murder. It's not the ugliness of divorce. Those things are are heavy. But lying can so easily come over us that we we so easily can participate in it. And so chances are that some of us, if you were reading ahead, you're like, oh, this week's easy. It's lying. I don't have a problem with lying. But the other weeks, it was like, ooh, those are, I don't even want to talk about those. I'm not even going to show up to life group because those are heavy, right? Maybe some of us have said that. I don't know. And then we come to lying, and we think lying is a little bit easier for us. At least that's how I think it is. But Jesus knew that this was a topic that was also heavy, and he needed to bring this to our attention. Um, So lying can so easily creep into our lives. And before we know it, the fish that we caught is now a 10-pounder, right? And the more that you believe it's 10 pounds or the more that you say it's 10 pounds to your friends, what begins to happen in your mind? We've all been there. You begin to believe that it's true. You know what? It was a 10-pounder, right? And then now you're telling everybody, and you don't even think twice about it, right? Why? Because you so easily fell for that. You began to tell yourself, and you, you psyched yourself out so much that now it's a 10-pounder, right? And so you'll do whatever you can do um, to make that a reality. By the way, on a side note, this, I, I read an article recently about uh, 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 two fishermen who, they did this for a living. They were winning all these types of awards, and they couldn't believe it. Um, true story, I don't remember their names or anything. Thing. This is a couple years ago. Um, and their, their fish were so heavy. And finally, people were tired of it. They couldn't believe how they kept winning. And so they took, the, they took their fish after they had put them on the scale. And a guy came up, just kind of unannounced, and he slit one of the bellies of the fish open, and out came weights. They were sticking weights inside the fish just enough to weigh the fish down, and people couldn't believe it. And let me tell you, I saw the video when it happened, and people blew up, and I would too. And they stripped them of all of their awards. They got fined, and they even, I think, I think there was even some, um, some lawsuits that took place of that. I think some of them even had to end up in prison as a result of it. And so all of that now leads us to our first point, which is integrity of our speech. Integrity of speech, if you're taking notes, integrity of speech. Now, the integrity of speech is a subject that is eminently relevant for us today because we live in a world where truth is on trial. We've said this before, but we, we can't even watch the news and believe it anymore. Not even your favorite station, sad to say. And so we try to find and we try to grope in the middle of this dark world. And where is truth out there? I just want to know. Why? Because there is an urgent truth shortage in our world today. Um, a couple of um, days ago, this past week, I was kind of sharing with, with my wife just about the, the, the tension and the, the challenge of kind of sharing these, um, these difficult topics, but at the same time, how I've been so surprised at how receptive these topics have been for the majority of us and how we've been learning and growing in our spiritual walk. And, and I love what her response was. And she said, you know, the, the, the reason why is because you're simply telling people the truth. She's like, people want to know the truth. As hard and and difficult is it for us to hear the truth, people want to know the truth. And so they're longing for the truth. And so we're just sharing the truth. We're sharing the truth of God's word. And the truth today, I believe, is more attractive than it ever has been before. So people want to know. 
And so we're finding little pockets of stories where the truth is being told, and we're being like amazed at some things that are happening, and it's all like revival is taking place in some places, and I think it's because people are longing for the truth. And Jesus Christ himself declares that to us, right, that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life is what he says, and we can trust him, and so we trust his word. So in Jesus' day, the religious, the religious leaders, the religious teachers, the spiritual guides, we could call them, um, had developed an elaborate system of oaths um, that created loopholes to get around the law and to, in a sense, skirt the truth. Remember last week, they did the same for divorce, right? Um, it was clear what divorce was, but they created loopholes and and anybody could get a divorce as long as you had a reason. So if your wife burnt your dinner, that's a reason, right? We talked about all that stuff. And so the same is, is true um, for us with, with oath is that they created more loopholes in order to get out of this, um, this idea uh, that I, I no longer have to tell the truth as long as I have loopholes on how I can beat the system. And Jesus was, of course, fully aware of this deception, and so he tackles this head on. And so as in the other three illustrations that Jesus gives us um, in, the, in the prior verse that we already studied, um, he, he brings it back to the heart. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's the heart. And you're going to find out that he's going to do the same thing here today. He's going to bring it back to the heart because the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And what is on the inside will inevitably come out, right, through our words. And so Jesus, is, again, is kind of getting to the heart of the matter. Um, and so Jesus is, is kind of taking this head on. He's dealing with these verbal, this verbal system of loopholes and clears the air on the truth that should always characterize our words. And so Jesus begins with this familiar phrase again, and he says, you've heard that it was said. Now this time, uh, interesting little side note that Jesus isn't quoting directly from, he's not quoting from uh, one of the Ten Commandments like he's been doing in some of the others. But here, um, he's kind of paraphrasing some other passages, some other verses that we would read in the Old Testament. We'll look at those in just a second. Um, so again, he's kind of paraphrasing, paraphrasing a few verses that these religious leaders were taking. They were taking these little sections of Scripture, creating loopholes to make them say something else, and then sharing that and disseminating that information as if it was truth. And so here's one of those verses in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12. It says, Do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And so these very faithful religious leaders would have known, would have known God's word. They would have known the law. They would have memorized this. They would have read this. They would have taught this. And so that was a popular one. Here's another popular one, uh, Numbers chapter 3, verse 2. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything that he said. And there are more that we could go to, but those are some popular ones that these religious leaders would take. And so they would look at these verses, create these little loopholes that distinguish between speech that was not under oath, and in, um, in other words, uh, oaths that were made to the Lord, and oaths that were just made to random um, people or random things, and we'll help you understand that. So this system was very much in vogue in Jesus' day. And these promises that I make are under oath because they have been made to the Lord, and these promises that I make are not really under oath because I'm not making those promises to the Lord. I'm, I'm making this promise to another person. And so the loophole was if you make a promise to the Lord, that one counts, and you better back that one up with truth and follow through. But all these other things that you say when you don't swear to the Lord or swear to your God Almighty, then those things would be just to you swearing an oath to someone else and it doesn't count the same way. And so it was giving you an out for always being truthful. And so this was the pop culture of the day. You must be honest and keep your word to the Lord, but this same integrity of speech doesn't have to apply to human relationships. In other words, there's wiggle room in your oaths for lies as long as those oaths are not declared to be made to the Lord. How convenient, right? Very convenient. So here's what some of these rabbis would teach. If you're going to promise that you're going to do something or you want others to believe that you, what you are about to say is truth, then you would employ a phrase, a phrase such as, as God lives, I will do this, or as God lives, it is true, or as God is my witness, right? Those are even some things that we even say today. I'm telling you the truth. 
And so these were some of the catchphrases that would be employed to back up your statement as being truth. And Jesus summarizes this for us perfectly when we go back to verse 33. He says, you've, you've heard that it's been said, right? Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. And so this was common knowledge. If you make a vow to the Lord and you say you're going to do this, you had better back it up. You'd better make sure that your words are truth, that you have integrity in your speech. And so the Bible taught that making oaths was very serious business and that your integrity matters. But the problem was that in Jesus' day, the, the traditional biblical teaching had come under very massive abuse. And so all of these catchphrases, again, loopholes were being created. Um, and this, is, this was how um, then lies were becoming so prevalent within their culture. And Jesus says it needs to stop. You think that you can do these things as long as you vow to the Lord, but if you vow to another person, it doesn't matter. He's saying, think again, right? And he's been saying this all along um, so far in this, in this section. And so somewhere down the line, some rabbis, not all rabbis, but some began to teach that this oath or this promise was not binding if it did not include the name of God. And so they were downplaying our, our integrity of speech within our relationships. It didn't matter as much. So the truth only mattered in certain areas. Again, how convenient. Now, notice what Jesus says next to us in the next few verses. He says, But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So let's cover one item kind of first that typically comes up quite a bit when people read this, and it's kind of right there in the first verse that we read, is, and the question that people ask is, is this verse telling us that Jesus is prohibiting all oaths? Is Jesus prohibiting all oaths? And that we should no longer make oaths in our world today. So some believe so. In fact, George Fox, who was the founder of the Quaker movement, you can research this. This is kind of a fun little story. Um, but he believed that it was so. In fact, he was sent to prison because when he was in court, he, he would refuse to swear on the Bible, to swear to God that his, tr that his words were true. And because of it, it landed him in prison. So to this day, when if you are um, getting ready on, to be on the witness stand, if that is you, um, now that the, the phrase has changed, you can thank George Fox for that. And so now it's, do you swear, right, or what? Affirm, right? Do you affirm that what you're about to say is true? If so, then that's what typically people will say if that's a part of their personal conviction. So I affirm that what I'm about to say is true. And so... Um, Jesus is, is saying um, that uh, I don't think what Jesus is saying here is that, that no oaths can be used anymore. I, I don't see that. One of the reasons why I believe that, and one commentator kind of brought me back to this story, first of all, I think um, that Jesus himself made an oath. This is kind of an, uh, if you look at uh, Matthew chapter 26, um, if you remember, Jesus is on trial himself. Remember, the high priest Caiaphas is there, um, and so Jesus is all along throughout this trial, we'll, we'll say trial, um, Jesus is, is being asked questions, and every step of the way so far, Jesus is silent. He's not answering anything. Notice what happens then in Matthew 26, then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? So he's getting kind of frustrated because he's asking him all these questions, and Jesus is just remaining silent. What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? I need to know. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And finally, after all of the silence, Jesus broke silence under oath. And what did he say? You have said so. It's true. It's true. So here... Um, we see Jesus himself is speaking, and, and he's honoring this official oath from Caiaphas. The Apostle Paul is another one who, there are several passages for the Apostle Paul where he takes an oath and, and appeals to God as his witness under the pressure of defending his own ministry and, and his life for his survival. So how does this translate then to us for real life? 
Do you ever find yourself in, in a court situation? I, I think this passage is telling us that you, you can say it's okay to say, I, I affirm that what I'm about to say is true. However, I think what Jesus is telling us is that oaths are not to be a normal part of our everyday conversation. Because this is what was happening in Jesus' day, is that oaths, even in just random conversations, oaths were entering into um, these relationships and people were using elaborate words, elaborate catchphrases in order to um, prove that their words were indeed right and that their, that their speech was full of integrity. And Jesus is saying, your commitment to truthfulness and, to, and integrity of speech should always be evident to all, not just sometimes. You don't need to use catchphrases there. No, I, I swear to God, right? That's kind of what people say in our world today. Watch, I don't like that. I don't use that, but that kind of seems to be the going thing that people often will say. No, no, I, I promise you that's an elaborate word or an elaborate oath as if they say that to back up that what they're about to say is really true. But what about our speech all the time? Shouldn't it always be true? You move on to verse 34 and 37 of Matthew. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to, to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil, evil one. So notice some of the things that, that Jesus then say, says to us. Don't swear by heaven. You think you're not using God's name, and that's okay, and that's the loophole. So don't swear by heaven as if that counts less. And then he, he more or less is saying, since God is there in the heavens, seated on the very throne, right? Don't swear by heaven. And Jesus then says, don't swear by earth as if that gives you an out, because God is even present here on earth. He's the creator of the earth. Everywhere we go, he is present, and this is where his feet actually rest, right, is what Jesus says. And then he goes on and says, in fact, don't even swear by Jerusalem. Don't even swear by your city, since it is the city of the great king of God himself. And don't swear by your head by saying, may my head be cut off if the words that are about to leave my mouth aren't true. That's what some say. There was another um, one in research that would say, um, uh, may my beard be cut off. This was one that Pastor Dustin would hate, but may my, may my beard be cut off if I'm not being truthful with my words. I love how Jesus then elaborates on this last point, and he says, um, you can't even make one hair white or one hair black. Some of you were like, no, no, I made all this white, <laughs> all right? <laughs> well, I've been counting. There's 12 right now. No, I, I think I can do that. Um, but, <laughs> but what Jesus means is, is you don't even say, he, he's like, even your very hair color is God's sovereign prerogative. Even your very hair color, God is in control of. You say, well, I can dye it. Well, the roots always come back, and you know how that works too, right? So everything you say and do and think takes place before the watchful eye of the all-knowing and almighty God who takes with the greatest seriousness the words that come out of my mouth and the words that come out of your mouth. God hears every word and God cares if you have integrity of speech. This next point we come to is the destruction of lies. The result of this system of rules in Jesus' day, I believe, kind of really became like an, an epidemic of where there was just frivolous swearing, where oaths became intermingled with everyday speech. And, and so as people were just talking and sharing stories, they were just can continue to interject all of these phrases. No, I swear, by my beard, and all these things that people would continue to say. <clears throat> While at the same time they're saying all of these phrases, they're literally lying through their teeth. And Jesus is like, no, your word needs to be your word. It's like the old example of a frog in a kettle, which, by the way, the frog in the kettle is a lie, um, at least from my understanding. Um, you remember that, the story how it used to go? You would take a frog and you, you put a frog in boiling water and immediately the frog hops out, right? But, if, but then the story went, if you take a frog and you put it in cool water and you slowly just kind of turn on the fire and, and, the, and the water gets hotter and hotter and hotter and the story went that eventually you would cook the frog, 
Um, from what I have gathered and researched in that story, that it's not really true that the frog eventually hops out, right? Um, but the story went that the more that you are slowly allowing things to take place within your life, right, you, you begin to find that things become more and more comfortable, and before you know it, you're cooked, right? That's kind of how the, the moral of that is. The, the lies that, that the destruction of lies is so subtle in our life. We begin to allow lies a little bit in our life. We, we embellish a story a little bit. We kind of tell a little white lie. We even have words for it. It's not a real lie. It's a white lie. And then before we know it, we continue to find ourselves getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And now lies are constantly coming from our mouth. Do you fudge on your taxes? That's just a little, that's a little white lie. It doesn't really matter. Does it? I don't know. The IRS has plenty of money, so it's Okay. I'm not so sure they do, <laughs> um, but when, when someone calls the house and your wife answers the phone, if it's so-and-so, please tell them that I'm not here, but just wait just a second. Let me run out of the house so it's true that I'm not here. Is, is that true? I would really love to have you over sometime when in your mind you're saying, I would hate it. It'd be miserable out of my mind. I'll never believe that, right? Then why say it in the first place? All of these little lies tend to lead us to bigger lies that, if they go unchecked, will bring destruction into our lives. And before you know it, you're lying in your marriage. Before you know it, you're lying in your business transactions. Before you know it, all of these things begin to come up into your life, and you can never catch up, and you're being burned to death like a frog in a kettle. When I was in high school, I had a friend um, who I really, really liked this friend. He was a good friend. He was a close friend to me, and um, probably at that time was, was considered one of my better friends um, who was faithful. But this friend, had um, he, he was a compulsive liar. And it, it, it came so prevalent within his life that I could never believe anything that came out of his mouth. He would lie to me straight to my face. And, and I didn't know how to handle that. You know, I was just a young teenager and trying to figure that out. And so he would tell me about this car that he was going to buy this weekend, and never bought the car. This thing that he had, and we all knew that he just didn't have it. And it began to just become so out of control that, that it actually affected our relationship where I never believed him anymore. And so he would say things. And so it created a wall. It created a division within our relationship where every time he said something, every one of his friends began to doubt whether he was telling the truth. And it was a game of crying wolf every single day became frustrating to me, and I would say that our relationship was very rocky because I could never trust anything. One commentary I researched this week said, so um, what Jesus is saying here, so in, in all of the playing games with these elaborate systems of rules, they, it created a profound spiritual schizophrenia where people would believe, yeah, I am not telling the truth, but at the same time, I'm not really lying here. Spiritual schizophrenia. It's just like the little child who tells you one thing all while behind their back, right? Their fingers are crossed, right? I don't have to be truthful because my fingers are crossed. I don't know how popular that is today with our little kids, but I'm sure it was popular in your day when, when you and I were kids. I would say to our parents, if I could give you some more free advice from your pastor, it, it's kind of cute when your little two-year-old comes up to you, right, and says, I didn't eat the cookie when their mouth is full of cookie and they have chocolate all over their face, and you think it's cute, and you take a little video of it, and you post it on Instagram for everybody to laugh about it, right? And it's cute now, but as parents, if we don't call our kids on that and help them to understand that integrity of speech matters, that, that it matters that we tell the truth, that it's important to God, if we don't tell them that, that before you know it, they're going to be like a frog in a kettle, and they'll be lying to you, they'll be lying to the authorities, and sooner or later they'll be having to listen to the authorities because the destruction that lies bring into their life will wreck their marriage, it will wreck relationships, it will wreck businesses, you name it. I would say um, address those things when they're young. We continue, verse 37, we come back to this. Jesus says, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I want to park on this word, the evil one, and uh, kind of brought my mind this week to several other um, verses and passages. Um, Jesus is saying, anything beyond the truth comes from the evil one. 
The passage in John chapter 8 where Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews and he refers to the devil as the father of what? Lies. He refers to Satan himself as the father of lies. And Jesus says to them in verse 44 of John 8, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. Satan, the father of lies. In other words, he's the original liar. He's the first person to ever lie. He's the creator of lies itself. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, maybe sometimes this, this week, and, and refresh your memory on the first lie that entered the world, that lie that was so subtle, wasn't it, that, that was whispered in Eve's ear, and she began to believe that it was true, like a frog in a kettle. And so she began to listen to some of these subtle lies, and eventually she contradicted God's very word, right? Right? to then her own husband then believed as well. He followed suit, and so have all of us. Lying is Satan's primary weapon that he uses against those who are God's children. He will go to great lengths to deceive you as you try to be obedient and follow Jesus. I promise you that. He will tell you lies that, that you don't matter. He will tell you lies that because of all of this in your past that God can't love you anymore, and he will continue to whisper those lies within your life. And the more obedient that you are to, to Christ and the more um, determined you are to following him, the more I would say that those lies may become more active in your ears. So God himself says in Proverbs chapter 6, another kind of neat passage where it talks about the seven things that God hates. One of them, by the way, is a lying tongue. A lying tongue. In fact, in this passage, the writer of Proverbs begins to point the finger back to the heart, very similar to what Jesus is doing here in this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Everything that he's addressing is going all the way back to, it's a heart condition. It's a heart matter. You need to get that straight. And so in Proverbs, the same thing happens. It's, the, the finger is pointed straight at our heart as being the main culprit for our sin. And all of this talk about these really crazy loopholes that were being created in Jesus' day, um, this creative, elaborate system that allowed one to lie and really, in essence, get away with it and not feel guilty about it and not feel convicted about it. It kind of sounds pretty crazy to us, doesn't it? But I think you all know that this happens in our world today. It happens the same way. And so we emphasize things when we're trying to tell when we're trying to share words with our friends, we, we use some of our own catchphrases like we mentioned before. I, I swear to God Almighty, some people like to say. Again, I don't believe that that one is appropriate. Some others say, um, I, w- would you like me to be completely honest here? What, what a stupid one, right? I mean, w- w- and should we respond? No, I'd rather you lie to me. But, and I find myself sometimes as I'm talking to somebody, I'm like, if, if I could be completely honest with you, as if to say that there are other times that I'm not, right? That, that's another one that we sometimes use. And we, we find ourselves in this elaborate system that we've created for our world. And Jesus says, no, let, let your word be your bond. Your yes be yes and your no be no. We teach catchphrases. Maybe when you were a kid, you learned some of these catchphrases. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, right? I swear on my mother's eyes that I'm telling you the truth. We would say, well, poor mom, right? It's Mother's Day. Let's leave mom out of this, right? Um, and so we, we don't understand this, but we do the very same thing. I've learned over the years, partly due to the friend that I grew up with, um, who was this compulsive liar, but I've learned over the years that the more elaborate and exaggerated someone words, someone's words are, the more likely it is that they're lying. The more that they, they preface all about what they're saying with this long, you know, couple of phrases that they throw out, the more likely it is that they're lying. And Jesus speaks into all of this mess and chaos of lies, and he says, why can't your word simply be your word? This last short point is a radical truthfulness. 
Jesus ends this section with this very simple call for all of us. He simply says, you have no need to swear at all, but rather simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus prohibited the use of misleading and deceiving vows, but he did not intend to prohibit all use of oaths and promises is what we're learning. We still have these oaths in court and oaths in marriage. That's another oath that we take, and we take that oath in the covenant of marriage before God, right, and before other witnesses. And so I think we can see that there are still necessary times when we have those um, opportunities to use oaths. But Jesus' call to all of us in this situation, I think what Jesus is trying to get to is that in all circumstances and situations that we are to be people who have integrity of speech, be a person who speaks the truth, be a person who's known in your family as being truthful, be a person who is known in your workplace as being truthful. When nobody else is being truthful and they're fudging the numbers and they're getting all the rewards, but you're being truthful and struggling through, eventually people will notice be a person who is, um, who is known to always be honest. And when you and I believe this way that Jesus is wanting us to live, that we are to be salt and light in the world, when we begin to behave that way, we'll reflect the love of Christ wherever we go. And we'll reflect the kingdom to which we belong, which is a part of the kingdom of God. I want to close with this little um, paragraph that I came across this week. Um, in one of these uh, commentary uh, called The Message of the Kingdom, and it's on the Sermon on the Mount, and the author, R. um, uh, R. Kent Hughes, says this, It is not easy to to be a totally truthful person today, but it is necessary for the church and the world. The world longs for freedom from dishonesty. Sure, it cultivates deception and even promotes it, But deep down, people long to escape the show of pretense. Many look eagerly to believers to display the honesty and integrity for which they so long. Our integrity as followers of Christ can make all the difference to a dying world. The avoidance of one small fib may be a stronger confession of faith than a whole Christian philosophy championed in lengthy, forceful discussion. When people know that you do not lie, your testimony will have more effect than all the theology you could ram at them. What a difference a truthful life can make. Wow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, your Sermon on the Mount. That You've been teaching us these difficult topics that have been heavy hard for us to swallow, but I would add, but so good. Thank you again for this week for for bringing up a topic that at first seems to be one that maybe we don't really struggle with, but then the more that we think about it, maybe we do. God, help us to be men and women of integrity. May our yes be our yes and our no be our no without any prefacing of phrases or elaborate words or systems or loopholes, but to simply just speak truth. God, help us to be truth bearers even when sometimes speaking the truth is hard. Help us to stay solid to your word and committed to each other to even tell the truth because that's what our dying world needs is more of us to become more like you. Jesus, thank you again for what you're teaching us. Thank you for this week. Continue to challenge us through this. Help our life groups as we, as we wrestle through this passage and ask ourselves some, some challenging questions on how we too can be salt and light in the world wherever you take us. We ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.